you're probably pretty familiar with the sounds of the heart, right? Lub dub, lub dub. Because um, you can hear it audibly, right? If you lay your head down on somebody's chest, you can hear it lub dub, lub dub. And we also call those two sounds S1 and S2. Both of them occur when valves close and then blood splashes against those valves. Lub, or S1, uh, occurs when the AV valves close, the tricuspid and bicuspid valves. Uh, dub, or S2, happens when the semilunar valves close, um, meaning relaxation of the ventricles, and you get your, your dub there. S3 and S4 uh, are faint, rarely heard adults. Um, uh, basically, you might listen to them uh, with a stethoscope to find some sort of irregularity. Let's move on and talk about some similarities and differences between the muscle fibers in a skeletal muscle or a cardiac muscle. Now, skeletal muscle fibers, as you may be familiar with, have these short, sharp action potentials, right? That happen quickly, and then you get repolarization very quickly too, followed by a relatively um, quick, sharp uh, contraction, right? You get uh, tension rises and falls pretty quickly. Now, this action potential, we rise, we have depolarization because of all the sodium coming in, and then potassium goes out and we get repolarization. Now, while you're undergoing an action potential, you can't undergo another action potential, right? It's currently happening. You can't do it again. Um, and so that's called a refractory period. Now, that will be important in a moment. Now, uh, in a skeletal muscle, you have to have uh, a lot of difference in terms of the strength of contraction, right? So you need to be able to take the same muscles and either, you know, pick up a, a couch, right? Or pick up a little bitty baby or a, a puppy or something, right? And if you pick up that puppy with the same force that you pick up the couch, boom, right? Puppy goes flying into the air. So um, you can do that in a few different ways. One is you just, you know, when you're picking up the couch, you engage more muscle units, more motor units, meaning more uh, uh, muscle fibers. But um, you can also adjust the strength of tension in any individual muscle fiber by having more or fewer uh, action potentials in a row. Because more action potentials in a row means you didn't have time to pump all that calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, so you've filled it with tons of calcium, and you get a stronger contraction, you also don't relax. And so if you have really, really fast action potentials, you're stimulating that muscle a lot of times right in a row, you might get tetanus, which is just sustained contraction, right? Um, and you know that's fine if you're holding up a couch, um, it's not fine if you have like lockjaw, right, or, or tetanus due to a, a bacterial infection, but generally it's not a big deal in your skeletal muscles. That said, if you have tetanus in your heart muscle, that just means you're not pumping blood, right? You just contract it all the time. To pump blood, you need to relax and contract and relax and contract. Um, so cardiac muscle does not want to undergo tetanus. And it turns out it can't because the action potentials, instead of going right up and right down, depolarize, repolarize, that repolarization takes a while because while um, that potassium is flowing back out, so positive ions flowing out, allowing you to become more negative, uh, you also have some other ions that are flowing in and it sort of balances out for a little while. Uh, and anyway, you get this long plateau. And that means that your refractory period is very, very long. And so you physically can't have this many action potentials in a row, right? And so you can't undergo tetanus. Now, as a result, the con contractions are very sort of slow to rise and slow to fall, but that's fine. It's not a speed contest with your heart muscle. It's an endurance contest. So again, with heart muscle cells, you get this rapid depolarization, just like in skeletal muscle, uh, but before the repolarization, you get this long plateau, and that's what gives you the long absolute refractory period. One way to look at how a heart is functioning is to look at its output. And the cardiac output is the amount of blood that gets pumped out of your left ventricle through your aorta in a given minute. And there are really two things that uh, affect that cardi out cardiac output. One is heart rate. How often are you pumping blood out of the heart, right? As the heart rate goes up, your cardiac output is going to be higher. Um, then you have stroke volume, which means each time you have a heartbeat, how much blood are you pumping out? The higher the stroke volume, the higher your cardiac output. 
Now, of these two things, heart rate's probably the easiest to adjust. And so when you begin to exercise or when, you know, you have a fight or flight response, right, um, the way that you increase cardiac output quickly is going to be to crank up your heart rate fast. Now, a typical resting heart rate is going to be around 75 beats per minute, give or take, uh, and a fairly standard stroke volume is going to be about 80 milliliters per beat. And so per minute, you are going to crank about 6,000 milliliters or 6 liters of blood through your heart. And again, if you adjust the heart rate a little bit or the stroke volume a little bit, you're going to affect the cardiac output. So let's take a look at each of these things in turn, starting with heart rate. Now, your heart is interesting in that it has something called autorhythmicity, in that it will contract without any nervous stimulation or hormonal stimulation. Just on its own, it will contract. And that's because each individual cardiac muscle cell will contract on its own. If you take a cardiac muscle cell and just stick it in a solution of the right uh, level of ions, it will contract every so often on its own. Your nerve... Uh, nerves and, and skeletal muscles, they need stimulation from neurotransmitters to open up those little sodium channels to allow sodium in to cause that initial depolarization, right? You let positive sodium ions in, you depolarize. If you let enough positive sodium ions in, you depolarize enough to get to what we call threshold, usually like negative 55 millivolts or so. And that causes a separate set of, uh, of, of, channels to open up. We call those voltage-gated channels, and that allows a ton of sodium in, and you depolarize completely, and that's what starts our action potential, right? Uh, but if you never get enough neurotransmitters to open enough of those uh, those chemically-gated channels, you never get to threshold. You never have an action potential. Your cardiac muscle cells don't have gates on those channels. They just let sodium in all the time, so they're kind of like an hourglass, right? Uh, or like a little egg timer that we used to use when I was a kid, like sand flows through at a particular amount of time. I may be using antiquated uh, uh, images here, but um, essentially you let a certain amount of sodium in, and every so often you're just going to depolarize to threshold, which is going to cause all your uh, voltage-gated channels to open up. Tons of sodium comes in, you depolarize completely, then you repolarize, you pump all the sodium back out, and the potassium back in, and then there you are. And then immediately... Sodium starts coming through those channels again, just like an hourglass, until poof, you get to threshold. And, and you're just going to contract at a certain rate. And if you put two myocardiocytes together, two cardiac muscle cells, they will contract together at the same time because they're connected by gap junctions. And they will go at the rate of whichever one's faster. Because of those gap junctions, the action potential will travel right from one cell to the next. If you put five cells together, they will contract in a coordinated fashion uh, at whichever rate, which, at the rate of whichever cell is fastest. So, if you look at your sinoatrial node, this is sometimes called your pacemaker. It's in your uh, atrium, your right atrium, and essentially what it is, is it's the patch of cells myocardiocytes that have the fastest natural rhythm of uh, contraction uh, of any of the other cells in your heart. Can, you can see that right here. And when it fires, it sends that action potential through a specific set uh, of, uh, of electrical conducting wires, essentially, through the atria, and it causes depolarization of the atrial uh, muscle, boom, right, and then contraction, right, depolarization of muscle causes contraction of muscle. And then it uh, leads that uh, signal, that electrical signal, to a second node called the AV node or atrioventricular node, which pauses and then refires that signal through this uh, atrioventricular bundle or AV bundle to this bundle branches and then up through these Purkinje fibers into the ventricular tissue. Um, now, a couple of things. That will cause the ventricular tissue to then depolarize and then that'll cause it to contract. And you need to pause here at the AV node so that it's not contracting while your atria are still contracting because then they're pushing against each other, right? And the ventricles are going to win. They're much bigger. But also, notice that the electrical signal comes down and begins spreading through the ventricular myocardium from the bottom up instead of the top down. That's because you want to start uh, contracting from the bottom up, right? Just like you squeeze toothpaste 
from the bottom up because the toothpaste comes out from the top. The blood comes out from the top, right, through the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So you're going to want to squeeze or contract this uh, ventricular muscle from the bottom. So as a quick review, the signal starts in the sinoatrial node, which is also called your pacemaker. By the way, if that um, gets messed up, they can now add a, a, an artificial pacemaker to your heart. But anyway, the signal then goes through the atrial tissue, or sometimes it's called internodal pathways, uh, causes depolarization of those atria. They will then contract, right? Then we go to the atrioventricular um, uh, node, the AV node, then through the AV bundle and the bundle branches and up through these Purkinje fibers and into the ventricular myocardium, causing it to depolarize and therefore contract. And then poof, we have ventricular systole. Now this conducting system and all of the myocardiocytes that are depolarizing individually collectively make a lot of electrical energy. And you can read that electrical energy, that sort of collective electrical activity that's happening in your heart, in something called an electrocardiogram, or ECG. You may have heard it also called an EKG. I think that's from the Swedish, maybe. Um, but anyway, ECG, EKG, same thing. It's a measure of the uh, aggregate electrical activity in your heart. So this is different from those graphs where we're seeing the depolarization of a single... Uh, muscle cell. Okay, this is all of these muscle cells at once. And you tend to see these patterns, right? These three main waves. You see a P wave first, boop, then a QRS complex, right? A little dip and then an R wave and then the S, so boop, 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 and then an S wave, boop. Well, what's going on here? Well, the P wave is showing you a bump in electrical activity that happens when the atrial uh, myocardiocytes all depolarize at roughly the same time. That's a little blip of electrical activity. That's your P wave. So your atria are depolarizing at your P wave. Uh, now mechanically, they will then contract. Okay, so we're measuring electrical activity with the EK EKG, but um, you're going to see um, that there's physical activity associated with that, meaning contraction. So P wave is atrial depolarization. QRS complex is ventricular depolarization again, followed by ventricular um, and contraction. So then we've got depolarization of both the atria and the ventricles. What's this T wave? Well, that's the repolarization of the ventricles, right? We repolarize those. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Mark, we have depolarization of the atria, then depolarization of the ventricles, and then repolarization of the ventricles. What in the world happened to the repolarization of the atria? Well, it's hidden. Okay, so notice that the ventricles, which are much bigger, have much more muscle, make a much larger electrical noise here. Um, and also note that the polarization is much uh, more electrically loud than repolarization, essentially. So we would expect a much smaller um, hump than the P wave, right? And it's happening, it turns out, at the same time as ventricular depolarization. So it gets hidden behind this QRS complex. So we never really see atrial repolarization because it's hidden by ventricular depolarization, right? It's like when you're whispering at the same time as another friend is yelling, right? No one notices your whisper for the friend's yell. Now that we are familiar with uh, a typical rhythm, right? P, Q, R, S, T, boop, 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 right? Uh, in the next video, we're going to begin by talking about arrhythmias, um, and, and what can go wrong with these rhythms.